You're listening to Cotton Tales Podcast, part of the Silicon Valley Black Project, which produced the documentary film, A Place at the Table, about the black pioneers of Silicon Valley. A Place at the Table can be viewed for rent on Vimeo.com, on demand, backslash A Place at the Table stem. Through Cotton Tales podcast, the Silicon Valley Black Project will continue to recognize the contributions made by African Americans. We will be featuring African American professionals, technologists in the fields of engineering, administration, and entrepreneurial pursuits from the past and present. Today, my guest is Deborah Watkins, founder, emerita, director of strategic partnerships for a black education network. A national organization dedicated to instructing educators in teaching methodology and practices as they pertain to African American students. I would call Ms. Watkins a culturally courageous leader in education. So tell me, Deborah, who is Deborah Watkins? <laughs> okay, well, first of all, thank you, Miss Kathy, um, for having me on your show today, um, doing this, this podcast. I'm not really sure where to start. So I guess I'll start from the beginning. I was born in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Moved to Pomona when I was uh, seven in 1960. Uh, and I... Uh, Grew up in um, that predominantly white community, Um, had all white teachers, K to 12. But because I love school, um, they loved me and they nurtured me. But unfortunately, they traumatized my brother right behind me. Put my brother on the school to prison pipeline when he was in kindergarten, literally. Now, I didn't have the words for that when I first started teaching 43 years ago at Independence High School in San Jose, right after I graduated from the Stanford Teacher Education Program. But now that I have the benefit of 43 years in education, I realized that they put my brother on the school to prison pipeline in kindergarten. Now, mind you, my mother had seven, six, six girls, and then she finally had a son for my dad. And the, the son was the, the, the boy was the apple of our eye. And so the boy was spoiled rotten. When the boy entered kindergarten, he was accustomed to getting his way and those white teachers weren't having it. Um, And so instead of seeing the genius in the little boy and that he was just being spoiled, he wasn't being, you know, oppositional, um, they would send him out of the office, send him to the office, send him to the office, send him to the office. And my mother worked in a women's prison. uh, And so we were on the other side of the law and we did not, um, you know, uh, mess around with uh, getting in trouble in school. So my mother had to come up for my brother. She knew something was going wrong. She didn't have the words either um, to describe what they were doing to her son, but she knew something was awry in that school system. And people often ask me, uh, Kathy, if I became an educator and if I'm so passionate about education because of what happened to my brother. My brother was put on the school to prison pipeline in kindergarten and in 10th grade, a white teacher called him the N word and he threw a desk at the teacher and he was expelled from the school district for a battery. And of course, nothing happened to the teacher. Um, And my brother spiraled into a life of drug dealing. And um, what do you do with a 10th grade education? And school has been a traumatic place for me from kindergarten to 10th grade. You don't want to go back um, because it's so bad. So what do you do with a 10th grade education? So you start selling drugs. And in a minute, um, you're in and out of jail, not prison, thank God, but jail. And after that, you're murdered at age 24. So my brother was murdered at age 24. And it was not the police. Uh, It was a black, uh, as far as we could tell, it was a black on black crime. Um, But my brother had just turned his life around. Um, this was 1978, and he was in my wedding, which was scheduled for 19, April 1979, and it was just devastating. And um, I couldn't talk about my brother's death for a decade. I literally suppressed it, uh, and it wasn't until Trayvon Martin was murdered that I actually wrote about my brother's death. Well, first of all, let me say, I, did, I couldn't talk about my brother for a decade. 
I went and got a second master's degree in education from San Jose State University. And that's when I was able to have the cathartic release necessary to talk about my brother's death. And I talked about my brother's um, death for the first time publicly through the newsletter that I had created for the, you know, not the California Alliance of African American Educators, um, which was a nonprofit that I started um, in um, 2001. And I talked about my brother's death and I also um, finally wrote about my brother publicly in our newsletter when Trayvon Martin was murdered. Um, because it just, you know, that it triggers. Every time I hear of another black, especially a black male, you know, being murdered any kind of way, it, can, it doesn't have to be just police violence. It's just even black on black crime. You know, anytime I hear about it, it's a trigger again about what my own brother suffered. So I have a hard time um, listening to those stories. And so what I prefer to do is to throw myself into building the black community so that no other black children will have to suffer what my brother suffered at the, home, at the hands of insensitive white teachers. And let me say here that we also have insensitive black teachers insensitive Asian teachers, insensitive Latino teachers. There are anti-Black people throughout the ethnicities and even within our own race. So let me just stop there. That's who I am. <laughs> I agree with you 100%. And I think the dialogue or the narrative that we're getting today is that all Black people are on the same side of the question. We all agree. You know, sometimes the one that gets chosen to make the change for us all isn't always the stellar, angel, angelic, wonderful person. It's that person who has lived life, who has struggled with life. That's the person that not, will many times change a situation completely. And um, I think that's what happened with your brother. He didn't live the life you would have chosen for him, but look at the lessons you learned from his experience. Yeah. Uh, had you not seen that uh, firsthand, you wouldn't understand how the system can literally change uh, someone into something that uh, it's not recognizable. You know, it's just yeah. not recognized. Tell me, I, I now I understand why you were so interested in school. You were probably interested in school when you were a little bitty girl. Yes, actually, um, my um, the 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 red haired, roly poly, uh, freckled faced Mr. Stevenson was my fourth grade teacher, and he said, "Debra, you're the best writer in my class. You should become an English teacher." Now I was in fourth grade, and what was I to know? What 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 was an what does an English teacher do? But I held on to what he poured into me. And later in life, um, I went to graduate school, as I pointed out, um, first at Stanford. And I earned my uh, teaching uh, credentials in English, French, and psychology, and became a high school English teacher. And, you know, I was able to find Mr. Stevenson many years later, and I told him how his pouring into me as a fourth grade little black girl who knew nothing about what English teachers did. Um, changed the trajectory of my life. How did he respond to that? He was just, he was, he said, you know, Deborah, no, people don't come back. You know, I, I don't hear, I don't hear from students. You know, we were, I was in Pomona um, because when I came to graduate school at Stanford 43 years ago, um, you know, my mother still lived in, in the Pomona area. So I would go, you know, visit back then. And uh, I would happen to be at one of, a very popular restaurant there in Pomona, and Mr. Stevenson happened to walk through the door. And when I say happened, we know there are no accidents in God's universe. You know, you I, you don't ever forget your favorite teachers, right? You just don't forget them. You don't forget what they look like, and they're frozen in time, right? <laughs> they don't age, they're always the same. And so I saw Mr. Stevenson, and I got out of my booth and went over, and I said, Mr. Stevenson, I'm sure that you will not remember me. I, I was in your fourth grade class. My name was Deborah Matthews. You said I was the Miss Matthews. I do remember you. You were one of the best writers. And I said, wow, that man remembered me, you know? And so when I wrote my book, Thoughts Held Hostage, A Black Teacher's Journey of Unlocking Young Minds, I have a chapter. My chapter two is called They Were the Ones. 
and it's teachers who I channeled um, in my own teaching, uh, teachers that I had that I channeled in my own teaching. And Mr. Stevenson was right. He's the first one I write about. Um, and he was just a loving you unconditionally white teacher. And I had a lot, that's who I had all the way through. But that was me. That wasn't the case for my brother right behind me. And that's the point I always try to drive home is that this white American society has a fear of black men. They, they just have this fear of black men. And I think it's, it, it's, it's been um, instilled in their psyche because of the media, right? And do you remember that cover of LeBron James holding that white girl looking like the gorilla from King Kong? Have you seen? So, you know, the fact that LeBron James was willing to be depicted like that, you know, holding the white girl, the white model, you know, is an example of what I call internalized racism, right? Or internalized oppression, where black people become the victims of their own oppression and the, the perpetrators of oppression against other black people. So, um, yeah. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I guess Le and Le LeBron probably did not think it through. The well, he clearly way. didn't. He yeah. clear because it, it, it has been that cover has been ridiculed around the world, and I'm, I'm and again, you know, he's. I, I'm not condemning him the person. I'm condemning the action that, like you said, he didn't think it through. I mean, any anybody would have thought it through. You know, I don't think I might be wrong, but I don't think that they would have allowed themselves to be an instrument of oppression like that. You know, I think, remember the uh, controversy that we had over uh, some designer that made uh, a mask and it had the lips on it, and then they had made some uh, shoes and they had the lips on it, and uh, they showed a sample of what they were going to send out that year, and the world just lit up. You know, people just said, no, you can't, you can't do that. And, you can't show those lips like that and whatever because somebody, there was enough people in the room who, uh, let's say, that saw it and said, it's got to stop. There wasn't enough folks in, in LeBron's life to stop him. That's so right. That's a know. great analogy, Kathy. Did you see the little T-shirt, the T-shirt that had a little black boy on it and it said King of the Jungle? And yes, that was yes. actually a T-shirt that was being sold across the country, across the world, uh, at, coming out of an, um, I forgot, an English manufacturer. And so what the black people did was they changed it and put a crown on there and made him, you know, a young king or something like that. But th these are the, the micro and the macro aggressions that, you know, African ancestry people have to deal with. And we've been dealing with this, you know, we have two pandemics, as you know, We've got the, 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 the racism pandemic that's over 400 years old yes. in this country. And then we have the COVID-19 pandemic. So Black people are dealing and have been dealing with a pandemic. And, and as an educator, I always say, and Black children have been, have been educated in a pandemic since integration. And I have issues with integration. And my main issue is that the spirit of integration never happened. I understood why they wanted to integrate schools because I'm not a segregationist. And my own experience was multicultural. I went to predominantly white schools with all white teachers and they loved me. I did well in that Eurocentric system. But I realized now that that system is not good. When, in fact, you know, I'm gonna share something with your, uh, on this podcast. This is, this is from my book. And um, I shared it this morning on another call um, with Tony Browder and Atlantis Browder when we were talking to some schools in New York City about replicating our cultural imperative program that we did here in San Jose for four years. And then we took national. And this is my favorite, this is the favorite part of my book. It says, while I only remember two teachers from my junior high years, I recall twice as many from my three years in high school. When I speak with black classmates who shared my Denisha High School experience, most still talk about how much they loved Mrs. Schneider. I am no exception. 
She was was my my junior junior year English English teacher. teacher. More importantly, she taught black literature. And I thought I had died and gone to heaven. As I alluded to earlier, I only had white teachers from K to 12. And I also attended predominantly white schools during that time period. With the benefit of many years of teaching multicultural literature and promoting culturally responsive practices, I realize now that I have been steeped in Eurocentric curriculum until my junior year in high school. I have no recollection of any teaching units that highlighted the contributions of non-whites to the world. And here's my favorite sentence from the whole book. To unabashedly promote one culture is dangerously wrong on so many levels. Not only could it lead to self-loathing for those who never learn about the greatness of their own people, but it can also serve as an incubator for white, what I call domination. People say supremacy, but I don't say supremacy because that suggests they're supreme over somebody and they're not. My mother taught us that they were never better than us. They were, you know, we were their equals, if not better than them. So while I'm not convinced that either of these was an overt objective of the curriculum, that was spoon-fed to millions of Black children, beginning with the Dick and Jane books of our kindergarten and first grade years, I have seen the deleterious effects of such a narrow focus. Why would Black preschoolers prefer the white doll over the Black doll in the 1950s? And in a similar study just done a few years ago, if the self-loathing was not ingrained in the psyche of those impressionable children. And I'm just gonna end, I'm just gonna end there, but that is from chapter two of my book, where I talk about, you know, because I only wrote the book for you, the book was published four years ago. So I had the benefit at that time of 39 years in education when I wrote that book. So I was able to think back on my own schooling, Kathy, and realize that this is what's wrong. This is, this is one of the major wrongs in, um, in, in integration. Because before integration, the black children had all black teachers and they, had, they went to school with all black kids. And so they learned their history. It was part of what they did. They knew about all of these famous black people. And when integration occurred, they were being taught by white teachers for the most part, not by black teachers, because those white schools were not gonna let black teachers teach their children. So they were taught by white teachers. And white teachers, like Tony Broward said on our call this morning, I I wrote it down. He said, you can't teach what you don't know. So the white teachers have been taught, they have been miseducated too. And so how could they teach? How could they teach what they didn't know, Kathy? But, uh, right. And in California, it was unheard of to have a curriculum that would include anybody of color other than to denigrate them. And that included Asians of every type. Right, it, exactly. Uh, it included the Native Americans, anybody of color was uh, treated as if they were here to for their the only purpose was to serve uh those folks of the higher class which would be the nordic looking you know uh european exactly and so you re- uh i remember being in a class and they talked about the negro who uh was brought who worked in the fields and picked cotton and the whole class turned around and looked at me like uh exactly. how do you pick cotton and, and i'm looking at them going uh, there's a such thing as a cotton gin, and it was recreate. It was uh, invented by a black man, and there, no, it wasn't. We've yeah. never heard of that. It's like, oh, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah, you go through it, honey. You, we've been through it. Listen, you started this California Alliance of African American Educators. What brought that about, Deborah? And I'm assuming it has much to do with what we're talking about. 
<laughs> yes, well, yes, well, thank you for asking that question. So uh, when I started teaching in the East Side Union High School District in 1977, Independence High School had just opened the year before, and it was a state-of-the-art high school. It had it was on 103 acres, it had a planetarium, a public school, I mean, a public library on the premises, a lab pool, an Olympic-sized pool. It was an absolutely stellar educational park, is what they called it. 5,000 students, and we were, in, we were divided into five pods, or villas, they called them, a 1,000 students in each villa. And each villa had its own principal, counselor, and teachers, core teachers. And so I stepped into um, that, onto that campus and it was a shiny new machine. The first new high school in Silicon Valley in I think about 10 years. They left nothing to chance. Everything was state of the art. So shiny new machine. I start teaching English. I'm gonna teach everybody. I'm gonna reach everybody. But I only see one or two black kids in each of my college prep junior and senior classes. Yet I see the black kids on the campus and I wonder why aren't more black kids in my class? So that was my first exposure to what people call an achievement gap. I don't call it an achievement gap because that suggests something's wrong with the kids. I call it an opportunity gap because there's something wrong with the system. And that means that if black children were given the same opportunity as white and Asian children, well, the, the, well, the well-to-do white and Asian children, they would do just as well as they do. They're just as brilliant. So anyway, um, fortunately, when I started teaching, there was already a group of black educators called Black Educators of East Side, B. And so I just joined that group and started, you know, working with them around, you know, how do we support black families outside of the school system? Next door in the, in the neighboring school district, Allen Rock, they had a black group called Black Educators of Allen Rock Schools, and that was called BEARS. So um, 38 years ago, Bears and Bees became the Santa Clara County Alliance of Black Educators, and I became one of the founding members. And from 94 to 2001, I was the president. I was always an officer from the beginning, but from 94 to 2001, I became president of the Santa Clara County Alliance of Black Educators. So I ran that organization for seven years. Um, and at the end of seven years, people were saying, you've done so much impactful work through the Santa Clara County Alliance of Black Educators, you should start a statewide organization so that more black children could benefit from the kind of work that you've been spearheading with your team. So um, we created the California Alliance of African American Educators by going to the presidents of the existing chapters of the National Alliance of Black School Educators. So the San Francisco Alliance President James Taylor became our founding vice president. The Fresno Valley founder of the Valley Alliance of African American School Educators became my regional coordinator for that region of California. One of the founding members of the Sacramento Alliance of Black School Educators became my treasurer. My secretary was the president of the Elk Grove Alliance of Black School Educators. And then my Bay Area coordinator um, was the president of the Oakland Alliance of Black Educators. So that's how we built the California Alliance of African American Educators. We had no chapter that was active in Los Angeles. So we, we found someone that I knew at the time I was working with the National Board um, Certified Teaching Program um, and I was able to get one of the young ladies who was a leader there through the UCLA uh, NBCTE, uh, Anna Fekwanukwi, and she became our coordinator. We didn't have a, a, a presence in San Diego, so I checked with my San Diego friends and was able to get Lynn a Taylor, who was a, an, a, a community activist. So that's how the team was built, right? All of these people representing the five regions of California. After two years, the people who lived in the Inland Empire, which is like where I grew up, Riverside, Pomona, San Bernardino, they had been traveling either to San Diego or to Los Angeles for our events. So they asked us to start a chapter there. 
So that is when we started a sixth chapter. We call it CAAAE for short. That's why we created that organization. I was the founding executive director of the organization and ran it um, up until two and a half months ago when I hired the first ever uh, executive director for what is now called a Black Education Network. Kathy, after doing the California Alliance of African-American educators work, CAAA for short, at a high level, people started looking at us nationally. And eight years ago, I started incubating what is now a Black Education Network because people said, you know, you've been spearheaded in great work in California, but Black children are doing much worse in Chicago, 38% of them graduate from high school. In Brooklyn, 42%. In California, 87% of the Black children graduate from high school. I was worried about the 13% who didn't. And yet, in Brooklyn, 42% graduate from high school. And said Chicago, 38%. I mean, the statistics, Detroit, they're horrible, Kathy. They're horrible around the world. So for five years, five years, people you know, these leaders these, who I revere in black education, they kept trying to get me to do national work. And I said, oh, it was hard working with them locally. I don't know about going national, but I finally, they kept feeding me this data. And then I felt like Jonah, like I was running from a calling, you know, that God had on my life. And so I finally succumbed to the pressure and um, the rest is history. Tell me, um... What was your what was the objective of a CAAAE and how did a child benefit from your organization? Well, let's just take one um, organization that I started at the same time as I started CAAAE, and that's the Dr. Frank S. Green Scholars Program. So I created the Green Scholars Program, which is a STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math program. We send 100% of our students to college, 90% graduate in four years with their BA or BS degree, and 60% of those degrees are in STEM, which is eight times the national average for black students. So that program is going into its 19th year, just like CAAAE would have been had I not changed the name to Ben. We just continue the CAAAE's work on a national level now. That's all we did, you know. Um, and so, um, Four years ago, I spun it off as its own 501c3, and I selected the person to take it over, Dr. Ayadeli Thomas, who is, by the way, the first Black woman to earn her PhD in electrical engineering from Stanford University. And that was in 2005. And she, that was 15 years ago. First black woman to earn her PhD in E from Stanford. And now she is running the Green Scholars Program and doing a phenomenal job. Her full-time job, she's an assistant dean at the Stanford Medical School, you know? And so she's extreme. And she has two of her own children in the STEM program that I started, okay? It is not my, I do have a permanent seat on the board. Um, because I'm the founder, but I need to stop saying my STEM program because I really am thrilled with Ayadeli's leadership and that they're still getting the same results I have always gotten in the Green Scholars Program. You know, I interviewed uh, one of your scholars, Miss Miss Baloney. She didn't stay with the program. She sta She started with us when she was in elementary school. Yes, she did. And she always talks about, you know, that, that STEM foundation that we gave her before her mother moved her out of the program into some other fabulous things. But yes, she is, that young lady is, she's absolutely phenomenal. And humble and loving and sweet. I love, I Obviously love Obviously you've created alliances with other groups, but other groups outside of education, have you created alliances with them, with other groups outside of the education sphere? And if so, what has been the, what have you accomplished with that? Yes, our most robust alliances are actually with companies, corporations, 
And these companies read like they're in the Fortune 50 <laughs> and they read like who's who in American industry. And those are the companies that I started partnering with 19 years ago for the Green Scholars Program. And they have been incredible supporters um, of our work. We've also partnered with uh, the Association of Black Psychologists, the Association of Black Psychiatrists, partnered with the Black Family Summit under the direction of Baba Leonard Dunstan. And the Black Family Summit is a coalition of about 30 Black-led organizations across the country. In fact, I just did a fundraising 101 class for them about six weeks ago. And the Black Family Summit comes together every five years to really just how can we work together for the good of um, Black people? How can we so do that? Back to this, uh, the Black Alliances, uh, Education Alliances. Do you uh, have any influence over curriculum uh, or types of books that are in the libraries at some of these high schools and junior colleges? Or what are some of the other things you might be doing? Oh my goodness, I, I can't believe that I would have gotten off this call without mentioning our Stanford Institute. <laughs> I can't believe it. Thank you for that question. So our, so our signature program that impacts curriculum, books, teacher training, whole, whole school buildings um, was created 19 years ago when I first started the CAAAE, California Alliance of African American Educators for short, Kathy, I just picked up the phone and called Linda Darling Hammond, who had just become a professor in Stanford's Graduate School of Education. And I asked Linda if she would partner with this brand new organization with no track record other than all of us and our many years of education. And I said, the, the first thing I wanna do, Linda, is start an institute for people who work with black kids. I said, because I have seen throughout my career in education that they don't know what they don't know. Tony Browder said this morning, they can't teach what they haven't been taught. Linda said, let's do it. You know, I've got a, I've got a multi-year, multi-million dollar grant for my school redesign network and I can underwrite your, your institute for the next three years. So that's what Linda did. She underwrote the institute and I brought in the best and the brightest African-American scholars from around the country for the next decade. So the first year we had Bob Moses of the Algebra Project. The second year we had uh, Beverly Daniel Tatum, why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria and other conversations about race. The third year we had Glory Latson Billings who wrote Dream Keepers, successful teachers of African-American students also did her PhD at Stanford with Dr. Joyce King, my Jagna for about, about 35, 40 years ago. Um, the, fifth, uh, the fourth year I had uh, Pedro Moguera, I don't, that's a whole nother person. We'll, we'll, you can Google him. Fifth year, I brought in Dr. Wade Novos, um, who was one of the founders of the Association of Black Psychologists. Brilliant, Dr. Wade Novos. Sixth year, I brought in Dr. Shiraki Holly because I wanted to show them what the pedagogy looked like when it was applied to a school of all black children. And at the time, Dr. Shiraki Holly was running the highest performing charter school in LA Unified School District called the Culture and, Lang Culture and Language Academy of Success class. And um, I brought in Shiraki to show them what does it look like when you apply what you've heard from these brilliant, these brilliant researchers and scholars? What does their research look like on the ground when it applies to black children? Shiraki was the sixth year. The seventh year, I brought in Lisa Delphin. She wrote the book, Other People's Children. Um, the eighth year, I brought in Carol Lee. Carol Lee and her husband, who used to be Don Lee back in the day as a poet. His name is now Hakeem Matabuti the oldest independent black school in the country. And it's called the Betty Shabazz Academy and it's in Chicago and it's over 40 years old. So I brought in Carol Lee. And the ninth year I brought back Bob Moses because they were still complaining about teaching algebra to black kids in the state of California. And in the 10th year I brought Geneva Gay. Geneva Gay wrote the Bible 
on culturally relevant pedagogy. And she built on Gloria Latson Billings original research with, and Gloria Latson Billings coined the phrase culturally relevant teaching and culturally relevant pedagogy. And then Dr. Geneva Gay built on Gloria's work um, and created the Bible that's used in colleges of education across the world, along with Gloria's book and the books of all those people that I mentioned. Well, after 10 years of bringing in the rock stars, eight years on the Stanford campus, two years at UCLA, because you know we're a statewide organization, people were coming to me saying, Deborah, we're not getting traction in the field because of systemic racism. We learn all these great practices from the Institute, but when we go back to school systems, they don't allow us to you know, apply them. So I said, you know, my board, I'm gonna stop the Institutes and I'm gonna go work on statewide policy. While I was out working on statewide policy with a whole group of fixed school discipline coalition people, 40 organizations from around the state of California, all working on the same thing to dismantle the school to prison pipeline, while I was out doing that, Linda Darling Hammond spearheaded the first change in 40 years as to how California schools are funded. And she ushered in the local control funding formula. And that local control funding formula uh, ended up uh, being um, the, the, the formula that we now um, use to decide how schools are funded. And the schools um, are no longer based on, well, Palo Alto Unified is the highest performing school district in the state of California. Why should they get the same amount of base money that East Palo Alto gets? That doesn't make any sense. I think that this is a good way to end this call and to say that we pivoted. So then after four years of working on, 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 on that, and Linda introduced it, I started the institutes again five years ago. And I tripled the amount of money that it cost to attend, and no school districts blinked. Not a one. They still, they still sent 10, 15 staff people, because they were serious school districts. And I would like to take the time to name a few of them. San Francisco Unified, Milpitas Unified, Hayward Unified, those Clovis Unified, those school districts are serious about closing the gap for black children. And I just want to elevate them in this space so that you know that there are people that care about our children that are allies and that are out there doing good work on behalf of those children. And I just would like to celebrate them and say that 60% of the people who attend our institute are white and they want to be there, Kathy, because they don't know and they want to know. Nobody forced them to attend and they love the institute because we don't start with, you know, your ancestors enslaved or we don't do any of that. We start with how are you going to teach Jamal and Lakeisha tomorrow? How are you going to reach them successfully? Our theme has been for 15 institutes, our theme has been pedagogies and practices for successfully reaching African American students. And it has been that theme on purpose for 15 years. And with COVID-19, we pivoted. And do you know we had the largest reach ever because people came from all over the country. So I'm so glad you asked that question so that I can end this podcast with a shout out to the Institute and tell people to go to www.aben a Black Education Network, A-B-E-N, the number four, and then um, ACE, ACE stands for Academic and Cultural Excellence, abin4ace.org, abin4ace.org. Go there and learn about who this year's Institute presenters were, learn about our very rich legacy of 15 years of being unapologetically focused on black children and their families and our desire to see them thrive, even in the midst of a pandemic. What are the plans for Mrs. Ms. 
Deborah Watkins for the future. Where are we headed? Well, I have stayed on with Shelly Henderson's blessing and my board's blessing. I've stayed on as founder emerita and director of strategic partnerships because that was my favorite part of my work was, as you pointed out earlier, Kathy, building partnerships and alliances with people who share our passion. I also want to give Larry Kramer uh, of the Hewlett Foundation a shout out right here because Larry Kramer has been quietly funding a Ben's work for the past seven years since he became the CEO of the Hewlett Foundation. And I just want to say that he just rolled out a $15 million initiative to fund Black-led organizations and organizations that um, attack anti-Blackness and anti-racism. And he also has rolled out a $150 million 10-year, 10-year initiative focused on that. And I'm happy to say that Larry and I have been joined at the hip for seven years and I have watched him transform the Hewlett Foundation into a culturally courageous, as Dr. John Brown would say, uh, from my from a Ben's think tank, now one of my board members. Dr. Brown wrote the book, Walking the Equity Talk, A Guide to Culturally Courageous Leadership. And he identified what culturally courageous leaders look like and Larry Kramer epitomizes that. So I just wanna give Larry a shout out because we would not have been, would not be able to do this work currently, um, work what we've done in the past 70 years without Larry Kramer's Hewlett Foundation support. And we would not do the work that we're going to do, the impact that we're about to have, it's about to be major, um, without Larry's unwavering support but let of us. me thank you for giving your incredible talent to the black community as far as that educating our children and being concerned about the way they're educated and the the techniques to educate them. That That is something that uh, I don't think has been addressed enough. Uh, and, uh, and to thank you for your continued efforts in that area. Uh, what a blessing. So Kathy, thank you. Thank you for asking me um, to, to come on today and uh, my my New York friend is blowing up my phone, I so see. let me let me get on over to her. All right, my love. Okay, okay. honey. Bye bye. Bye bye now. <laughs> thank you, Miss Watkins, for sharing your story with us, and thank you, podcast fans, for listening.